Hello, and welcome to Trade Talks, our regular series on all things related to trade and transportation. I'm Tom O'Brien with the Center for International Trade and Transportation at California State University, Long Beach. And I'm very pleased to have as my guest today, uh, Tyler Reeb, who is the Director of Research and Workforce Development um, at the center. So full disclosure, uh, Tyler and I know each other very well. We work very closely with each other. Um, and Tyler does a wide range of, of things related to transportation and workforce development, um, including addressing challenges related to the new mobility workforce. He draws from industry benchmarking, labor market analysis, uh, scenario planning, systems thinking, do a lot. Uh, but one of the reasons why we wanted to have Tyler on today's Trade Talks is he also is the editor of a recently released uh, volume called Empowering the New Mobility Workforce. Um, and that's going to be the foundation for what I think is an interesting discussion on the future of work uh, and what it means for transportation and mobility systems. So, Tyler, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's great to have you. Um, as I said, we wanted to have a discussion about uh, what we're observing uh, in the area of work and employment and what it means for the, the transportation sector. Um, but I want to be, begin with, uh, with the big picture, and that is uh, where we're seeing the, the future of work. And I want to start with a, what I think is an, is an important question, and that is the, the difference between workforce development and, and education. I notice in your, your title it has workforce development. What, what's the difference between those two and why that, is that distinction important? It's a very important distinction. It's a good question. I think the best way to think about it would be um, think about education as a road and think about workforce development as a bridge. And workforce development is critical at each phase in a developing professional's life. Coming out of K through 12, you need a bridge so that you can find and orient yourself quickly and be efficient with the education that you need to then jump on the next bridge to hit the ground running in the workforce. So they are very interrelated but separate. Workforce development initiatives paired with thoughtful education means young people getting the training they need and getting into the workforce without wasting time and money and jumping into fulfilling careers. Now, that, may, that makes a, a lot of sense. It's, it's interesting, and correct me if I'm wrong, workforce development was never sort of viewed as the principal role and responsibility of the university, and yet here you are. Uh, in a university uh, doing both research and workforce development. Is that, is that a new phenomenon? I would say it is in a lot of ways. Uh, I think the best way to really tackle that question would be to think about what has happened historically in this country, which is the United States is a hive of talent. People want to come from all around the world. Uh, so often employers could just lob out a job description and talent would bubble up and it was a very laissez-faire type enterprise. Young people could go to college and get a degree in something that maybe was conceptual, maybe not even related to what they would ultimately do. And what we're finding more and more and more is that employers are struggling. Their bottom lines are being hit hard. They don't have the talent to grow and to be efficient. And this is now resonating throughout our entire country. Studies are coming out and we're realizing that this is one of the most important issues facing our country in our economy. So it's gone from being a box that you check mm. to say, yes, we, we do this workforce development stuff, to realizing that it's a critical research priority that also requires very strategic, actionable steps that require a lot of finesse in coordinating leaders in industry, government, and education to, to make it happen. So it's using the research to better understand where we're going so that yeah. we can plan for it. Absolutely. I think one of the things you mentioned, the, the economy, um, I think there's a lot of, of fear and uncertainty about the replacement of jobs uh, by robots, by artificial intelligence. So I guess a, a, a basic question for you is, is the future of work, work? Or are we looking at something that is dramatically different than what we, we do now as a society? Well, I think it will be dramatically different, but my instincts and the research indicates that a lot of what we have learned from history will, will repeat itself in this automated, um, more um, computerized future. And what I mean by that is we're looking at a convergence of human systems and machine systems. 
And I think the best way to actually understand where the future of work is going to go is to, is to think about where the people are going to be. So much is said about a future economy, a future uh, workplace where robots are doing everything, but ultimately human beings are going to design, develop, operate, and maintain these machines. And we're also learning right out of the gates that it's not efficient to be entirely automated. Um, it's been widely published how Elon Musk and, and in his efforts to automate the Tesla automotive manufacturing encountered a lot of inefficiencies by not having people on the floor. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a blend of where we see machine and human systems meeting to move that forward. And what do we look to in the past to sort of understand the future? What trends help us better predict where we might be going? Um, you know, you, you referenced Elon Musk, but that's a relatively recent sure. uh, phenomenon. But is there something in our, in our past history in developing education systems and, and, and the workplace itself that give us some direction about where we might be going? Yeah, there's a number. The one that's really forefront, in my mind, reflecting on this new decade we've entered. We're now in the, in the 20s um, of the new millennium. We're 20 years in to the 21st century. And we are embarking upon a decade where we will see more technological change than ever in the course of human history. And that's on the heels of the prior decade that we just finished that broke all records, which followed a previous decade which also broke all records. It's, it's hard to really understand how much things are going to change. So one thing that I think we can look at that's a really convenient touchstone is look at the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. when in that period, things were changing at a faster rate than we'd ever seen before. And one of the uh, trends that really emerged quickly there was apprenticeships. Traditional education couldn't keep pace with this astonishing rate of change. We are now facing a rate of change that is exponentially more than that and all of the other record breakers that preceded it. So I feel, and the, and the input from industry and government education is that we are going to see a next generation form of, in, of uh, apprenticeships to help keep pace with what's going to happen with all of these transformational technologies. Here again, it's an example of workforce development augmenting traditional education. Mm -hmm. We're going to see um, apprenticeships and similar models with jumping and jumping, jumping in and jumping off points out of K through 12, two year, four year graduate education, I think even um, new forms of postdocs uh, post that have more hands-on component. That's interesting. The, the challenge, I, I imagine, as we sort of speed up the revolution, is the importance of data and technology and, and being in a position to actually use it effectively. What types of data are most important in your work in, 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 to, in understanding uh, the changing nature of, of work and the workforce? Uh, well, there's a whole bunch. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is the same thing I always say about network connections. Is you, we all have that friend or family member that talks about how they have 2,000 members in their social network, and then right. you ask them, do you know anybody in this network? And the answer is, your network is only as good as the relationships that you have and the understanding that you have which, with each node in that network. Mm -hmm. It's better to have 100 really good connections in your network that work and advance your interests uh, than 2,000 anonymous. I think the same thing can be said of data. Big data, we hear all these, these topics bandied about, is, is, a, is a lofty, really almost inaccessible consideration for most applications to workforce development, understanding education, even understanding where the economy is going to go. So I think the key is to identify key metrics that you can build predictive analytics around to really understand where things are moving. So to your point, uh, we look at historical data, which is useful to a point. Mm -hmm. BLS data um, derived uh, um, out of the census, which comes out every 10 years, and the household community survey data, which comes out every five. And we look at current occupations. There's things called standard occupational codes, which of course you know about, Tom, that apply to existing categories of jobs. What we're looking at in the future is a future where we have jobs that don't even have titles, let alone codes yet. So. Data is important to benchmark and understand where we're going, uh, but there comes a point when we literally don't have data to predict. Mm -hmm. So I think the key is to identify and distill down the key metrics that we do have and can depend on, and then know when to 
study the workforce, study the economy in a different way. Hey, you, you reference, so it's not just the, the future of work, it's the future of workers as well. Um, what, do, what can we glean about, you know, sort of an aging society, um, you know, an aging workforce in retirement, um, the, the power of a younger generation coming up with different skill sets? Um, what do we know about, what do we know about that, the role that they'll play in the future of work? Well, first of all, we're facing a massive workforce shift within the transportation industry overall across all sectors. Roughly half the population are baby boomers who could, in theory, retire at any time, right. which means we need to replace half the workforce. Uh, that's a big deal. Um, when we look at just the general public in an aging population, there are things like aging in place that could save the country billions of dollars and also provide a better quality of life for a lot of aging folks who want to stay in their family home and do mm -hmm. these things. And the future transportation systems can make that possible. In order to serve a population like that, we'll need to upskill the workforce to be able to accommodate the needs of seniors who want to live and remain at home given what new technologies have made possible. Mm -hmm. And what about the younger generations? Younger generations, it's, it's a tough nut to crack. We, you know, a lot has been said about the millennial generation, which most millennials are now in their 30s. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about incoming generations, we are talking about millennials, but we're really talking about Gen Z. They call them the digital natives and even the generation coming on board after that. Uh, the key there is to, number one, develop a career pathway. And what that really means is help young people help these future generations envision their life story through a career lens that gives them a sense of meaning and helps them understand that as they gain more experience and gain new competencies, they can earn more money, but also secure a place in the economy, in the workforce where they have fulfilling work. Going back to your talk about the future of work, will there be work? There absolutely will be work because human beings are social creatures and they need to have a sense of purpose. So it might be that the work involves less uh, toil and maybe hands-on manual labor. Mm -hmm. um, there still will be a role for physical jobs in that future. But having said that, how can you empower the future workforce, young people, to envision a compelling, interesting, challenging career where they can contribute and quite literally rebuild their communities in new ways that are more sustainable, more efficient, and more humane, getting back to the aging in place and helping some of the vulnerable in society that don't always get connected via transportation and mobility options now as they could in the future. That, you, ra you raise a good point, and um, I, I like the, uh, the, the notion of sort of a new set of skills and competencies. I think the, the, often when we talk about millennials or Gen Z or the digital natives, um, it's, with, it's somewhat dismissive when in fact these are generations that are bringing new skills and competencies that could improve the nature of work and that um, are things that maybe the, the old guard just don't fully appreciate yet. Is that, is that a fair assessment? I'd say that's fair. I think it it's, it's goes both ways. I think on some level there is so much focus on the incoming generations that some of the baby boomers that have contributed a lot throughout their whole career feel like they're being shown the door quicker maybe than they want to and there are some skills that could be passed forward through mentorship, proper succession planning, things of that nature. Um, having said that, I do agree that we need to champion these, these new generations coming in and understand that they have skill sets, they've been born into a world, they have intuitions, instincts, every generation innovates. There's always something that comes out of the next generation and to not really uh, cultivate that and to champion that is a mistake. And also maybe a facility with technology that older generations uh, might not be, a, uh, might not be as, as open to or as willing to embrace. Yeah, and I think, that, I think the, where really the concentric circles overlap with the generations is focusing on a, a first principles approach to solving problems. So in, in, in engineering terms, that means you use history to a point but there's also a point when you think in a fresh way about it, you take the problem apart and you consider a solution in a whole new way. Mm. And I think in those environments, if you have teams using first principles approaches where you've got 
young generations aware of the new technologies, the new ways of doing things, paired with some of the experience of some of the uh, more seasoned professionals, together they can come up with brand new ways to solve problems that benefit from the equity of experience, but are also energized by some of these fresh new ideas. Yeah, I think that's, that's a nice way to put it. One, one of the things that you talk about in your, um, in your book, Empowering the New, the New Mobility Workforce, is about the impact of, of transformational technology. And the, the transformation is occurring at all levels, right? We shouldn't assume it's just occurring with one generation or with one segment of the industry. It really is about changes at the level of society and how we, how we prepare for those. Yeah, undoubtedly. Uh, it's, consumer preferences alone are changing everything. Um, you can order virtually anything you want and have it delivered to you in some cases within two hours or an hour. All of this is done through this invisible mode of technology, um, of technology and trans er, transportation rather, uh, the supply chain. And I think to understand all of these things, how all of this is going to drive things is a fascinating proposition. The, the reason why the book uses the term mobility workforce rather than transportation is because the future will so, uh, and socioeconomic uh, mobility will be determined by individuals and communities and their access to the actual mobility systems that get them where they need to go and get them the things that they need for their communities and their families. Absent that kind of mobility, you have you lack mobility, and this is where usually you find poverty and stagnant wages, um, lack of opportunity. Um, my big eureka from the book is, is exactly that. Social mobility, economic mobility is directly connected to the access to the actual mobility systems that move people and goods. So we're, we're observing a transformation itself from transportation to mobility in society that is due in part in, in, uh, because of technology itself, but also because of some of the other socioeconomic factors that you're, you're talking about. That, and I think also the parallel digital information streams that, that run alongside these actual mobility systems. There's so much data taking place, which is transforming the way the economy works. We've got blockchain coming on. We've got a future where we're gonna have vehicle to vehicle transactions that will make the exchange of commerce that much exponentially faster than it already is right now. And I think that all of this is, is mobility of one sort or another. What's also fascinating is that with 5G coming on, we're going to look at realities increasingly where mobility means not moving at all Interesting. because your workplace can rapidly connect you to wherever it is you need to go. This, of course, then brings all of this data into the planning sphere, into the future scenario planning, where we begin to think about, again, first principles thinking, how do we do it in a way that learns from all the um, lessons of the past, but also doesn't put blinders on and preclude us from leveraging opportunities to be more efficient and more sustainable and more empowering yeah. for communities and businesses. And I think that's a great place to, to take a pause. Um, we've talked a lot about the big picture, and I think you've given us a nice uh, transition into the second uh, segment where we'll be talking about specific changes in transportation, things like uh, blockchain and 5G. Uh, join us after the break. This is Trade Talks. International business, huh? Number one, know the culture of that country. Come alive with Pepsi. Translated into Chinese is, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the dead. PepsiCo made that mistake in Taiwan. Learn about strategic planning, government policy, and policy analysis, and so much more. You can become a part of this exciting career field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Hello, and welcome back to Trade Talks. I'm Tom O'Brien. And my guest today is Tyler Reeb, the Director of Research and Workforce Development at the Center for International Trade and Transportation at California State University, Long Beach. Tyler, welcome back. Uh, before the break, um, you threw out some fighting words in some arenas, uh, blockchain and 5G. 
Um, and we were talking about the big picture with the future of work. But I want to segue a little bit into transportation and how these technologies are changing our transport and our mobility systems as you reference them. Can you talk a little bit about 5G and blockchain as examples of how they might reinvent the way we move both people and goods, I guess? Sure. So 5G, I think, a lot of hay has been made of 5G. I think we're really just talking about something faster than 4G that's going to just facilitate a more rapid exchange of inf information. And maybe the best way to think about it is we all remember, well, some of us remember when we had dial-up technology with our internet, and then we suddenly got our first taste of broadband, and you realize, wow, my computer hasn't changed that much, but boy, does it ever work faster, and can I, can I, boy, can I ever work more efficiently now? Uh, just consider that within this connected environment, uh, the connected environment of a city, for example, where mm -hmm. you go from 4G to 5G, and suddenly new, more rapid rates of information exchange are possible, which really bumps things up for transportation and mobility systems. For example, you can put 5G enabled cameras along a busy intersection along with micro sensors and suddenly you have complete situational awareness of what's going on. Mm. Suddenly you can begin to gather all of the anonymized cell phone information of every passenger moving through every conceivable mode of transportation in an urban environment and then you can take that information and using predictive analytics, uh, machine learning algorithms, begin to develop systems that can make possible uh, improved traffic systems. Um, you know, signal light synchronization, uh, a whole host of other things where every node in the network, every vehicle, every mobile device makes the collective network that much more intelligent. You add in things like blockchain, which again, it's one of these terms that's become very mystified, but I think for the purposes of this conversation, we can talk about what it really means is an open ledger where you've really daylighted the whole transactional picture where nothing is hidden behind smoke and mirrors and you can see an entire transaction. When that's possible, you make it possible to audit an entire commercial exchange. You've got cookie crumbs that you can follow back to origin. You can begin to eliminate corruption. Um, cyber hacking and things like that. Mm -hmm. So all of this layers into this more integrated mobility system uh, where certainly the traditional legacy forms of transportation, the roads, the rails, the tires, yeah. all of it are critically important. The highways, the, you know, all the um, bridges, everything, that all remains the same. But what is equally important in this new era are the forms of connectivity, the 5G, the fo new forms of, of commercial exchange, blockchain, uh, the algorithms, the uh, predictive analytics that help us make it all more efficient and make the data work for us rather than confuse things. So is there a risk though that this, this leads us to that sort of dystopian future that people fear when they look at technology and gathering data and monitoring our every movement, how much a part of that is, is do you fear as well? Well, I, George Orwell is one of my favorites. And he was, in, in many respects, I think 1984 was a, was a letter to millennials. 1984 was one of the markers for the millennial generation. Now, of course, we have other incoming generations that are even more enmeshed into this digital world. The book features a child on a tricycle racing headlong into an Internet of Things future. And it's bewildering on some level when you think about it. But I think going back to our earlier conversation, what's most important to keep in mind is that we as human beings have agency because we are the ones that develop the systems, the machines, the automation, the connectivity. We have agency in determining that. And if we create a dystopian future collectively, that's the failure of human beings working collectively, leveraging the um, democratic channels to ensure that all of this happens. There's certainly cause for concern. Um, at the same time, there's a great opportunity to make sure that these systems work for us and we don't work for them. Yeah, that's a good point. And this is, I'm, I'm assuming you would agree that this is not a future that's coming 
tomorrow or next year. This is something that's going to be happening over time, albeit fast, like you suggest. But for example, um, in the world of, of truck driving, um, I believe I'm correct in stating that that still remains the biggest need, workforce need that we have in the transport sector in both the, the short and the near term. Yeah, absolutely. I, by, it's forecasted that by 2022, a million, 1.2 million truck driver jobs are going to need to be added. And I think, I'll just take from Bill Gates here, I think he was uh, right on the money when he said that most businesses and individuals chronically overestimate what can be accomplished in one year, but radically underestimate what can happen in 10. Mm. And I think in this way, you can look at trucking as a great example. We've got the biggest gap in the transportation workforce is trucking, no doubt. We are not going to see automated vehicles solving that problem in the next two or three years. There's tests and there's things that are happening that right. are going to make it happen in the longer term. So what is required is keeping your eye on the prize in the long term, understanding and preparing to make sure that those automated systems, as we just discussed, work for us. We don't work for them. But also figuring out how do we, in the near term, find opportunities to get people in cabs, get people those good jobs. So a good example would be veterans. Okay. There's all kinds of veterans that have heavy equipment experience, and there's a channel, um, you know, there's laws in place that make it possible for a veteran coming out of the military who has that experience to take the written test, and get in the cab, and be driving immediately, contributing. Um, it's also important to make clear that these jobs can lead to positive careers. They're not one-offs. So some young person getting into trucking who works hard for a few years, who finds a way to become an owner-operator, can be making six figures, saving money, and eventually maybe growing a small little fleet that could lead to a career. So I think a lot of this does all go back to workforce development and telling the stories that represent the opportunities for a whole host of emerging professionals moving forward. And, and I, I expect that we're not going to be swapping out a fleet overnight and all of a sudden we're going to go from diesel, you know, diesel trucks to autonomous electric trucks overnight. There are going to be, fa there are going to be phases and there are going to be new opportunities that come with those phases. Do you see it similarly? Yes, and uh, there's, I think, a, a pretty um, agreed upon structure for that. There's five phases of automation and the last two, four and five, are basically automated vehicles that drive themselves. One, two, and three are phased steps going toward that. Most of us who buy new vehicles already have some of those technologies built into our vehicles. So we're already getting a taste of it, whether we realize it or not. Um, California has been a very forward thinking and testing truck platooning, which is where you have a string of trucks on a highway, one behind the other, that currently all have drivers in them. But there is a future possibility that's very likely where the lead driver may be there and the trucks that follow behind drafting off the lead truck, conserving energy as a result, um, also benefiting from the visibility that the cameras in the front truck provide to the back mm -hmm. truck, um, you know, will all take place. But it's going to be gradual steps. The same thing with the transition to electric vehicles. It's not going to be overnight. Yeah, and, and um, um, you raise a really interesting point about, you know, the role that government and policy plays in all of this because while I know California is a, a leader in some of the testing, autonomous trucks are not, cannot be tested in on the road in California right now and that's the impact of, of policy on creating, some of the, creating or not creating some of those opportunities that you were talking about. Yeah, in a lot of cases you can look at the cell phone rollout as perhaps the most <coughs> instructive um, example for electric vehicles. In some ways the most important thing is the charging infrastructure mm -hmm. to make that possible. Not unlike the cell phone. The cell phone is basically a widget. If you don't have the wireless infrastructure to connect it all, it's useless. The electric vehicle is of course an amazing um, innovation, but if you can't drive that and easily charge it and get where you need to go, it's not really relevant. Mm -hmm. Also important is you need leaders in government to clear, just like cell phones needed the spectrum cleared and facilitated through the FCC, regulatory bodies at the state, federal and local level are going to need to work together to make it possible for industry 
uh, working with research and development to develop a system that will really work as the batteries come online, become more efficient, the charging becomes faster, range becomes better. We'll see all of that happen. Again, it's not going to happen overnight, but we can't underestimate what's possible in 10. Well, and, and that sort of leads to my next question about the, the broader supply chain. This is, this is trade talk, so we're interested in trade and transportation, and trucking is just one component. But when I hear you reference the, the integrating nature of this technology, we're really talking about connecting systems of systems in a way that's, that's different. It changes the way we move people and goods, and it changes the type of work that we have to do to do it. Yeah, I mean, the, trucking is a great way to look at it. We're going to look at a future where truck drivers will continue to be in the cab, but the truck will likely be driving itself most of the time, not unlike a pilot in a plane, mm -hmm. autopilot. What's that truck driver going to be doing? The job might not even be called truck driver in the future. They're going to have a highly uh, sophisticated cab where they could be carrying out freight forwarding, customer service, all kinds of competencies and, and, and job duties that current um, truckers aren't doing that could make their job more complex, um, higher paying, more entrepreneurial potentially, a whole bunch of things. Uh, when the truck goes off grid or breaks down, you need that licensed driver, that expert, to get behind the wheel and get the job done. So some of it will remain the same, some of it will change. So part driver, part diagnostician, part who knows. Sure. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned skills and competencies, and earlier you also mentioned the fact that some of these jobs we can't even name yet. We're not quite sure what they'll look like. So does that mean your advice to a young person would be to begin developing new skill sets and competencies that could be useful in a number of different settings wherever the future takes us? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would say maybe the simplest way to put that is develop skills that are very applicable across a whole range of sectors. So project management, mm. that's never going to go out of style. Um, it's also important, I think, to be a student of the economy, to learn to become, um, I've heard this term used more recently, uh, we've, we've heard a lot about creative problem solving, but creative problem finding. Mm. Use your research, use your insights as a student of the world to look at problems, because problems are the bedrock of innovation. Mm -hmm. We always hear about these frustrations in business or in research and development or in government where you have fits and starts, but it's in those frustrating spaces where you have an opportunity to innovate. And I think that's what I think we need to bring to the next generation. This is where these hackathons and some of these ideas are really good is, is give a young person a problem and say, um, unfortunately, previous generations have not been able to solve so this problem, same. but you can. And you have tools at your, at your disposal and proficiencies that previous generations didn't. And things are gonna happen. Yeah, I guess that's why the, the idea of a data scientist, which was not around maybe 10 years ago, is about not just accepting the data for what it is, but, but finding, um, finding some meaningful story in what the data tells us and what we can do with it. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, on some level, you had predictive analytics, um, all kinds of data science paired with storytelling. So on some level, we have the most ancient human technology of all, more relevant than ever, paired with an information age that has data coming at us faster and more furiously than ever. And I think the key is, is it's both. If you have a bunch of data and you throw it on the table, you just have a data dump. Mm -hmm. If you have the ability to look at patterns and tell a story with that data, you're going to find yourself in the C-suite, or you're going to find yourself providing recommendations for investors where they're going to make a ton of cash. Right. We're, we're taping this in a, in a port city, so the, the, the items you talked about, understanding of economy, good communication, storytelling, um, data, is really important in a hub for, for trade and transportation. Um, I, I wonder what role the partners of industry can play in facilitating um, that knowledge acquisition and accumulation. Are there policies that the public sector at the local level can, can do to facilitate 
um, workforce development and elevate it as a priority. And it doesn't have to be local. It could be state or national as well. But are, are, they, an, are they a partner? Should they be? Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the great things that, uh, great opportunities I've had is to study the supply chain while also studying the workforce for obvious reasons. But one of my big takeaways has been that a supply chain thinking should be applied to education and workforce development. And what I mean by that is if you're a leader of an organization and your biggest problem is talent, you ought to invest in talent. That means you need to be connected to every single link in the chain along the career pathway, which includes K-12, through the entire post-secondary continuum of education, as well as all of the employment and experiential learning opportunities so that once that emerging professional is ready to start working in your organization, you've invested in that talent and now you're going to get your return on investment. So in that way, it's a community. Uh, one of the chapters that concludes the book, it focuses on a community of practice. And this is this idea where no one individual is indispensable, rather leaders in industry, government, and education work together to create civic market solutions where the entire community is what's indispensable. If one member leaves, somebody else can come in and fill that role, and this is an ongoing effort to invest in talent, to solve operational problems, to look at new ways to transact and facilitate uh, exchange in the supply chain, all of these things. And that, that notion of a community of practice, practice to me suggests something that's dynamic and ever-changing and that you need to sort of be ever, ever vigilant. The, and it also, I, I, I think, speaks to your, your, um, the concept that you shared with us about sort of not just transport but mobility being a solution. And I suppose that also means things like transit systems, which we haven't talked about, but they're part of the fabric of urban society that also changes in this new world that we're talking about. Yeah, and then here again, I think the United States will be a very interesting um, petri dish for that. One of the things that the United States does very well, uh, perhaps as well as any country in the history of countries, is generate free enterprise solutions. We're going to find private sector mass transit options that are going to compete with public sector, public sector transit options. We're going to see um, micro bus equivalents of, of Google Pool, or excuse me, um, Uber Pool mm. and Lyft, where six people in a given metropolitan region will all punch in where they want to go, and they'll all be directed to walk to a certain corner, and in real time will rapidly be to taken to where they need to go. So we will see all kinds of changes in the way that people are moved around. Um, and some things will remain the same. If you have a rail line that goes from point A to point B, and that train is always full, that's a very good business model. That's never going to go out of style. What we need to address are situations where we've got half-empty buses, rail lines that aren't full, and these, there's ways that other forms of technology can fill those train lines, and then there's other models that I think are going to emerge. Well, I think that's a, that's a good place to take a, take a pause, um, focusing on good models, best practices, and, and good ideas moving forward. And that will be the topic when we return just after this break. This is Trade Talks. Do you love to travel? Understanding the world and all of its diverse cultures? Ever thought about becoming a foreign service officer? Living in another country and helping to promote a positive image of America? Or going undercover and working for the CIA? Or as a lobbyist, representing different interest groups to members of Congress? You can become a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Hello and welcome back to Trade Talks. I'm Tom O'Brien and my guest today is Tyler Reeb, the Director of Research and Workforce Development for the Center for International Trade and Transportation at California State University, Long Beach, and the editor of a recently released publication, Empowering the New Mobility Workforce. Tyler, welcome back to Trade Talks. Um, before the break, we were talking about not only the, the nature of, of work, the future of work, and changing transport systems, 
um, we were talking about technologies and maybe some new models that could lead us in the right direction. And so I wanted to, to begin by asking you about sort of best practices that you've observed in your work, uh, maybe uh, collecting information for the book, talking to experts, about how we approach the changing future when we don't know exactly what it looks like. I guess the biggest thing I can take away from looking deeply at this issue for the last five years is that the one thing we know is that things are changing faster than they have ever changed before. So that means that if you are going to rely on traditional education to solve those problems, you're not really innovating. Doing the same thing in the face of exponential change more than you've ever faced before is a pretty um, non-responsive way to handle things. So the best way to address all of this change is to find new ways to augment traditional education to more rapidly address changing transformational trends. And, and I, by, by traditional, I'm assuming you, you mean sort of following lockstep a series of, of courses leading through traditional educational institutions, maybe focused on degree programs. Um, is, that, is that what you're yeah, referencing? Exactly. Yeah. That's still going to be necessary. We're still going to need engineers. We're still going to need folks going through MBA programs. All of that's very necessary. And in those instances, interventions within those programs are very useful. Targeted certifications, things like that, so that you can get that good bedrock of education, that foundational knowledge, but then cue in through workforce development interventions, building those bridges from academia to the workplace but also, we need to, again, first principles thinking, rethink the way that folks are trained. Rethink what's necessary to, do, um, to solve these problems. A term that's being kicked around a lot now is middle skills occupations. These are jobs that don't necessarily require a four-year degree, but are critical and also very good jobs. There's the a lot. That, do you need a high school diploma? Do you need any training to get? to get started? In, in, in a lot of cases, these are folks who do have bachelor's degrees, so certainly it doesn't preclude you if you have one. But in a lot of cases, you have an, uh, scenarios where somebody could go to a community college, get a two-year degree, which I might add is much more affordable in a time when education is crushing a mm -hmm. lot of folks and where uh, it's questionable how long the student loan reality is going to go along before the bubble pops. Um, two-year educations in community colleges with targeted training, a lot of experiential learning, workplace learning, and then getting into the job. Um, there are a whole host of technical jobs that require a hands-on know-how that um, need to be put into place. Um, homeland security, um, cybersecurity, jobs like that, there's 200,000 or more jobs that are going to need to be filled in the coming years to ensure that our supply chain systems are resilient in ways that we previously um, didn't require or need. And if I, if I understand you correctly, you're sort of envisioning a world where somebody's taking a traditional degree in criminal justice, but at the same time having the educational institution facilitate their certification in cybersecurity or data, you know, good data practices, something like that at the same time. Is that, is that yeah, what we're talking exactly. about? We're talking about a really a transdisciplinary way of thinking where we're cutting across disciplinary silos to solve problems. I mentioned earlier aging in place. That's going to require a workforce that has transportation that goes to people's doorsteps and although the bus itself might be in 10 years time automated and drive itself, very likely you could have healthcare professionals on the bus tending to the needs of people who are coming and going from healthcare facilities. Now ask yourself, are the people on that automated bus healthcare professionals or transportation professionals? The line, the, the, the line blurs. And this is, I think, where we have to look at mobility. Mobility is um, very much a concept, getting people where they want to get in life, getting the, what they need. At the same time, there are literal physical mobility systems that move people and get people where they need to go. And this is where I think a problem solution way of looking at education is more and more important. Again, a first principles approach. What do we really need? Some of these new occupations are 
uh, with, with current um, educational price structures, just unfathomably expensive. What are ways that we could figure out to make the education more lean, more streamlined? Are there ways that we could pool the resources of different universities together to create more niche degrees that one university might not be able to offer on its own? Could we have ways for professional experience to count as units toward a degree in the future? How can we, we more rapidly deploy professionals who are prepared to design, develop, operate, and maintain the mobility systems that we need to facilitate all of the smart cities and all of the um, um, just tantalizing opportunities we see in the future. You raise a couple of really interesting points. One is, um, if, I, if I hear you correctly, there's a lot of the changes being driven by the demands of the person being educated, an expectation to, to develop skills and competencies that are immediately relevant um, in, the, in the workplace. And they're driving a lot of this change that we in ed education have to respond to. Yeah, I think it's a menu-driven approach on some level. I think the education that people pursue in the future will not will be looked at more a la carte than uh, perhaps it was in the past. It's already happened with TV. Mm -hmm. People said for ages that you, in order to get HBO, you got to buy the bundle. You can get it a la carte now. I also think that incoming generations are pretty savvy. I think they understand that they need to be very thoughtful about how they procure their education. There are a lot more studies indicate uh, young people today are much more mindful about debt burdens and things of that nature. So the educational providers and the employers who invest in this talent need to be mindful of that. There is um, a very doable scenario. Um, there are all kinds of ways where industry, education, and government could work together to train future generations so that they're able to contribute to the new mobility workforce which is going to reshape our economy without miring them in all kinds of debt. The, the other thing that's interesting is when you talk about sort of this, this, uh, this balance of skills needed, I can also envision a, a way in which you want to contextualize some of those ancient uh, skill sets that you talked about before the break, you know, the communications pieces that make them more meaningful and more relevant to a student so that it's not perceived as being, you know, one of those throwaway degrees or a waste of time to study history or, or communications. Is there hope for that? Yeah, I think uh, we did a study on um, legislative impacts on municipal planning organizations and a whole bunch of new requirements were put on these MPOs which was a burden on their workforce. One of the things that we learned in surveys and interviews and things like that was that public outreach had become a really critical component. And you ask yourself why that is? Well, if you're serving the public, you ought to learn very clearly what the public wants and needs. And you can't do that within the confines of an office. You can't model that unless you get that data, unless you get that information. Um, it's also just worth making clear to all emerging professionals that the communication skills, written, making a presentation, giving a talk, uh, those are CEO skills. That's what, you, that's what puts you at the top of an organization. Those are leadership skills. They um, used to be referred to as soft skills, right? Yeah. But they're, they're essential. Uh, they're hard no skills if you want to run a corporation. If you can't communicate, um, you're toast. I mean, everybody jokes around and says you hire for technical and you fire for lack of soft skills. Um, you hire for both is really what's going on. We can't wait though until somebody gets at the university or the community college, right, before we introduce these ideas, these concepts, and begin developing some of these skills and competencies. What, what should we, we, we be doing in K through 12 um, to, get, to get this started and to help us prepare as a society? Well, all the career pathway research tells us that Sixth grade, seventh grade is about as late as you want to start. There's evidence that it could be even earlier. Um, the wonderful thing about children in, is that they have huge imaginations. And the idea is, in any organization, is to channel the creativity and the inspiration of your workforce because that's the X factor. And I think so. there's such a tragic die-off sometimes. There are so many kids 
boys and girls playing Legos and, and dreaming of the future. There's so many opportunities to make them aware of career paths and, way, and things that they could strive toward early on so it's on their radar. The big challenge, as you're getting at Tom, is that most people don't know enough to know. And I think that's where the awareness campaign starts. Um, ASCE, the American Society of Civil Engineers, developed an IMAX film called Dream Big, and it was a way to help young people reimagine engineering, reimagine that they can quite literally rebuild America, which is, a, which is exciting. And I think that's the key. Uh, bringing in guest lectures, um, hackathons, uh, contests, uh, re-energize the science uh, project idea uh, when kids do their annual science fair. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things to just bring excitement, to empower them. And I would imagine connecting it to the world around them, right? You can't, you mentioned Legos and, and even something like SimCity asks a young person to envision what, what the built form, what the city, what their world looks like. We should take advantage of that, I would imagine, because we can't have a, a smart city without a smart workforce. I would agree, and one thing that I think needs to be um, always kind of put front and center when we talk about the new mobility workforce is if we are going to need to replace half of the workforce, we need to look very seriously at the numbers. And right now, the current mobility workforce has an 80-20 split for men and women. The, the mainstream, the overall workforce in the United States is about 53-47. If we can get gender parity in the new mobility workforce, we've gone a long way towards solving a lot of those problems. And this goes back to some really early interventions in K through 12 to make clear to all the young women that there are great jobs out there that they can have agency in reshaping their country um, and they can lead organizations. And that's not only good for those young women who go on to lead organizations, that's also good for the young men and the, and the boys who see those women in those positions. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about transformation, that's really where it goes. You, can, you can't legislate, you can't solve a lot of our societal problems, but what you can do is you can transform through changing the levers of power, um, presenting opportunity, things like that. And that really, I think, to me, gets to the higher calling aspects of the work that we do. I imagine too that um, you know we've we are a, a rich country in terms of diversity and language skills and often those those languages are seen as barriers when in fact they could be opportunities to to a, a, a very diverse uh, workplace where skills and that are that are taught by thinking in different languages are very useful. Yeah we're talking about global trade there's more than one language out there. And I think the idea uh, of learning how to communicate to your audience applies certainly to understanding how to speak the right language. If you, um, if you wanna do diplomacy, if you wanna do business, then you have to be able to directly communicate with your, your base. And if your base speaks a different language, then you need to get over that hurdle. And in some cases that technology is often a different language too. Being able to communicate through data, tell stories, that's all part of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. What, what's the biggest unknown uh, that we're facing in trying to prepare for this, this future? What's the most vexing problem to you? What keeps you up at night? Uh, I mentioned it earlier, the student loan situation is, is, is a big problem. It's already broken. We already have a situation where information over the last 20 years has gone from being very expensive to dropping to just wholesale prices due to the democratization of the internet. So you've got one hockey stick going down like this. At the same time, we see educational costs, the converse hockey stick going all the way up. Those two trends can't continue like that. So I don't know what's going to happen with the economy in the future. I don't. People make predictions. We're in a period of unprecedented growth. Uh, what is clear to me is that new models to finance the education of the next generations um, and also new models to train are extremely important. And I, so how that's gonna play out, I don't know. 
What I do know is that it will only happen if leaders in industry, education, and government come together in that wonderful American trifecta that leads to civic market solutions that led to the satellite, that led to the cell phone, that led to the rapid digital TV transition. And I think what we now see in the coming decade are smart cities, intelligent transportation systems, systems that make aging in place more effective, and then also the mobility that is made possible by not having to even move. You, you, um, you mentioned the, the potential here in the U.S., and I heartily agree with you, but you've spent some time looking outside of the U.S. at these models and best practices. Are there lessons that we can be learning from places like Europe, Asia, Latin America, um, Africa, things that are, that are um, also facing similar challenges in different contexts? Yeah, in, in uh, the European models for uh, preparing the future mobility workforce, um, a lot of um, cooperation across borders from different countries, um, universities partnering together to offer uh, degrees where students might be based at one university but are benefiting from a subject matter expert in Hamburg or maybe somebody in um, Athens to get these specialized degrees. Um, to be more nimble. Um, we, when we look at South Korea, we, we have to learn from their rapid deployment of 5G. Also, I think the sensibility coming out of that country where being literate is a, is a criteria applied to both math and reading. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, you don't hear in, you know, in, in some countries this idea that, well, they're not a math person. Um, and I think some of these standards are going to need to be applied here in the U.S. so that um, math can be taught in a way where it can open up your imagination, it can be creative. And I think uh, we can learn from some models internationally, certainly. As we get close to the, the end of our time together, I want you to sort of look into your crystal ball. Um, you talked about 10 years down the road. What is, um, what is the, the, the city look like? What does mobility look like? And what does the educational system look like that responds to the challenges demanded by it? One thing that we're seeing that already has a lot of momentum is we're moving away from an owner model to a network-based model. And I think that's going to continue. I think that that's going to, if done right, and if, as we talked about in the beginning, um, the democratic principles and processes are applied to this rollout, we'll find a future city where um, a young person, a single mom, um, can get where they need to go in a way that's not so burdensome, in a way that um, is not um, having you mired in traffic and congestion in a city that's more sustainable. So I would see a lot of that, a lot more cooperation, if done right, if done wrong, we have a future where we have whole, way too many autonomous cars driving around by themselves, more congestion, more confusion, and more digital divides. So that really, I think, is the key, is to democratize these smart cities, to democratize these mobility systems, because it can go one of two ways. And, and that gets back, I think, to your community of practice, right, to ensure that everybody's working together toward the same toward the same end. And uh, at that note, um, we're gonna we'll wrap it up here. But I wanna thank you, Tyler, for your, your insight and your contributions. Um, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Trade Talks. We'll look forward to having you join us around the negotiating table the next time we reconvene. Thank you. I'm Tom O'Brien. <laughs>